So if you are an introvert who feels like it's just an extroverted world and you are a disadvantage because you're not an extrovert, or you feel like there are certain things, tasks, skills, events, whatever that you can't do because you're an introvert, then stay tuned because this episode of The Quietly Thriving Show is for you. Hi, I'm Vicki Regina, and in today's episode of The Quietly Thriving Show, I'm going to be digging into the topic of introvert-extrovert conditioning, what that is, how that's impacted you, and possibly even held you back in life, and even extroverts, surprisingly. And I'm also going to be talking about how you can really identify your strengths as an introvert and embody those, which is going to help you to reject all of that conditioning that tells you that you can and can't do things as an introvert. So... Let's dive in. Um, so to get started, let me share a little bit about my story as uh, as an introvert, growing up introverted. Um, when I was a kid, like a really small kid, I was very, in addition to being introverted, I was also very, very shy. Now, introversion and shyness are not the same thing. A lot of people incorrectly assume that it's just interchangeable, that all introverts are shy. And that's not true. There's a lot of introverts that aren't shy. There's a lot of... Um, Yes, there are introverts who are shy, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be. And you know what? There's even extroverts that are shy. So uh, they're definitely not interchangeable. But for me as a child, I was both. And as an adult, most of the time I'm not shy. I don't really feel that that shyness anymore. There are a couple times here or there, maybe certain situations where I might find myself feeling tongue-tied and shy again. But for the most part, um, I kind of outgrew that as I grew up, but as a child, I was extremely shy. I I didn't talk a lot to anybody outside of like my family or my little circle of friends. Um, And I think the thing that was always a struggle for me as a child was I did very well in school. Um, But of course, because we live in this very extrovert bias society, there was a lot of focus on participation, speaking up. Uh, So I always got comments on my report card like, oh, she needs to participate more. She needs to speak up more. And I never really understood why that mattered if my grades were good. Like if my grades were suffering, then why did it matter? Um, I guess I can understand maybe like a a well-roundedness, but at the same time, what they were expecting from me was to be something that I wasn't, to be somebody that I was never going to be. Even now, when I'm much more confident in in group situations or in a classroom type situation, I'm still not the person who's the first one to raise my hand and the first one to start offering and just speaking off the cuff. It's not my nature. Doesn't impact my social skills and it doesn't impact how how well I do in a class. But because of that conditioning that we're going to talk about, it definitely is something that I think all of us introverts experienced in school is this this pressure to be something that that we that we aren't. So as I went through, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, um, I experienced that throughout the whole way. I think I started to be a little less shy once I got to high school, but I was still pretty, still pretty quiet. But when I got to college, that is when I I was still quiet. I'm always going to be a quiet person. But once I got to college, um, I kind of just leaned into my introversion a little bit more without realizing that's what I was doing. I was on a scholarship, an academic scholarship, and I didn't have a college fund, so I had to keep my grades up. So I just decided, you know what? I'm not really into the party scene. I I really need to stay on top of my studies. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do what I do, and I'm just gonna study, and I'm gonna keep my grades up, and that's just what I'm gonna do. And that was fine. And I think after I finished college, there was some regret about that. The, like like I didn't really get to experience the like the full college experience. Um, but in the job that I took after I graduated, it was a role where they hired in a lot of new, uh, they hired in a lot of people who were also just graduated from college and everybody was moving to uh, this the location where this office was. So I kind of got the college experience after college in the first few years of, of working in, in corporate because of the people that I was around and the people that I had gotten hired in uh, and doing the same job that I was doing. So 
everybody was super social. Every Friday night after work, we would go to this restaurant or this bar that was right near work. Uh, somebody was always having a party every single weekend. Uh, we lived in a kind of an expensive area of the country. So nobody lived by themselves. You had to have roommates. So it was a very, very social uh, few years of my life. So I felt like I kind of ended up getting that, that college experience. Um, and it was exhausting. Like it was fun, but it was also exhausting because I remember trying to keep up with all of my extroverted coworkers that they could have gone all night long. The more, the longer we were spending time out together, the more energized they became. For me, it was the opposite. The longer that we spent together, you know, out doing whatever, the more tired and drained I became. And I, and I used to kind of beat myself up about that. Like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just be like them? You know, just suck it up and like it. But it was really hard to try to, to try to be in that space. I didn't want to turn them down because I didn't want to be, you know, not invited or, you know, seem like the loser who was just going to go spend a Friday night by herself. So it was really hard to put that, you know, put my needs on the back burner to try to fit in because I thought that was the only way that I could fit in. So that was pretty much like my 20s. And then once I got into my 30s, everybody was starting to get married and, you know, move away. And we were, we could then buy, you know, our own places or, or rent our own places. We didn't have to have roommates. And so I was then able to start to have the space to just do what I wanted to do and to spend time with myself. And it was, it was so lovely. And I just felt so much more myself that I started to relax into that and feel more confident in that. And I think it was around that time that I started to, to, to learn more about introversion and to learn what it meant and started to feel a little, you know, more confident in who I am as an introvert. And then once I got into my forties, it just even more, you know, I became more empowered in what I was doing. And I started to really speak up for what I needed. And I started to, to just notice things through a different lens of this extrovert conditioning, you know, whether it was at work or whether it was out with friends, there was this expectation of, well, you have to speak up more, you have to volunteer more, or the people that were speaking up the most were the ones who got the plum assignments at work, or they got the promotions. And it just seemed unfair as I saw other people, myself included to some extent, that that got passed over or looked over because they weren't the loudest person in the room. But also noticing that some of the people that got passed over were way more qualified and had better ideas than the person who was the loudest person in the room. And so that started to really irritate me and fire me up like, well, wait a second, this isn't fair. Why are we all just presented with, with one way to be? And so that's what really drove me to focus on this, not only as a coach, but as I, as I step more into like a speaker role, um, is, is letting people know like what introversion actually means, what it doesn't mean. Here are the myths, here are the misconceptions here or why, here's why you don't want to be exclusive to introverts. So I go out and I talk about introvert inclusivity and it's really empowering to see that this conversation is expanding because I think it's something that introverts don't really hear this a lot and they need to so that they can really start to ground and root into why they're valuable as an introvert, you know, leaning into those characteristics and strengths. It's what makes them shine. And so, yeah, that's really what got, uh, got me going on this path. So with that in mind, let's actually talk about what an introvert is versus what it isn't, because there's a lot of mis mis misunderstanding about what it is or confusion, even amongst introverts. So I think it's helpful to just start with the, with the basics you know, the basics, the basic understanding of what it is so that we can start to peel back, you know, what it isn't so that that can help you to understand where this conditioning is coming in and how the conditioning has influenced what you have been believing to be true about being an introvert um, or being an extrovert. So introversion is, is, I don't like to call it a personality style or a personality trait. It's more of just a preference for how you live your life, how you show up in the world, how you interact with other people. What defines an introvert versus an extrovert is based on where you source your energy. So introverts source their energy by spending time by themselves or maybe with, you know, 
a, a partner or somebody that that they have a very strong, um, you know, like family, they have a strong connection with. But in general, it's usually spending time by yourself is where you really get that sense of being able to recharge. Extroverts recharge by being around other people. They get that that energy, that boost of energy, like plugging themselves into the wall. They get that from being around other people. So for introverts, they get drained by being around tons of people. Extroverts get drained by spending too long on their own. So it's just it's just a different way of, of sourcing energy. And neither is right or neither is wrong. It's just a different way. Uh, another factor of this is how susceptible you are to being influenced by external stimuli. So noise, visual things going on. So if, you know, you drop an introvert in the middle of Times Square, that can be very overwhelming for introverts just because of the lights, the noise, the people, this, there's so much going on. I know I don't like going into restaurants where they have the music really loud and everybody's trying to talk over it and you can't, there's just so much going on. It's, I can't really pay attention to the person that I'm that I'm having a meal with because there's just so much competing for my attention. And by the time I walk out of there after having dinner, my brain is fried because it's just been overstimulated for you know an hour, two hours, whatever. So there's um, usually extroverts are not as impacted by that external stimulation. Um, introverts tend to be more of an internal processor. So if you have something on your mind. Introverts generally need time alone, you know, or, or maybe not necessarily alone, but we need to think things through before we're ready to talk about them. We need to process things. We need to sort of consider the options, connect the dots before we're ready to start talking about it. Where extroverts are more verbal processors. They like to talk things out, um, to, you know, speak about what's going on. And that's how they, that's how they process information. That's how they see the dots and start connecting the dots is by actually speaking about it and talking about it. So just two different ways of showing up and interacting with people. But the thing is, is that it's a scale. Nobody is a hundred percent introverted. Nobody is a hundred percent extroverted. Everybody has a little bit, you know, well, depending on where you fall on that scale, you may have a lot of introversion and a little extroversion, or you may have a lot of extroversion and a little introversion, or we've got our ambiverts who are right in the middle who, who enjoy characteristics of both. So, um, and I'm not going to talk about the ambiverts today. I'm just going to talk about introversion versus extroversion, but that's all it is. Introversion has nothing to do with how well you speak, how um, much, how good of a communicator you are. It has nothing to do with with how much you are, you know, how capable you are of being a leader or a team lead or hosting webinars or, you know, doing presentations or being visible and being in front of people. Introversion has nothing really to do with that. And we're going to talk a little bit, bit more about that as we get into the conditioning. But this conditioning has led a lot of introverts to believe that all of those things are things that they struggle with that they can't do because they're an introvert. But in reality, again, introversion has nothing to do with that. All it is is where you source your energy, how affected you are by external stimuli, and whether you process things internally or externally. And that's it. So let's talk about what this conditioning is. So from a high level, conditioning is, and I heard somebody say this uh, several months ago, and I thought this was such a nice way to phrase it. Conditioning is when your nature, so who you are, your nature, is uh, it becomes a victim of your nurturing. So it's when one acceptable way is presented to you that is, that's in opposition of, of, of who you are or the way that you do things. But society says, well, no, this is the way. This is the way you have to do it. And conditioning ends up leading us to, to believe things that are true that may not actually be true. But because that seed was planted so long ago and it's been reinforced throughout the years by all the various ways that we see conditioning, we don't realize that we can challenge or um, reject these, these beliefs because they feel so true, they don't feel like it's something that that we can that we can change or that we can deny. They just feel like this is capital T truth as opposed to, well, no, it's it's just a belief that's not necessarily true. So it, you know, it it removes our ability to have that sovereignty in our life to choose what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So and this this conditioning, this extra ext extrovert conditioning has led a lot of introverts to believe that 
they're at a disadvantage because they're introverted or that they need to fix it or overcome it. I have clients that come to me thinking that I'm going to help them to overcome their introversion. And that's just not what I do. I don't help you to overcome it. I help you to embrace it because when you embrace it, that's when you you stand tall in it and you start to do things your way. And you start to realize there's so many different ways to do everything. There's not just one way. And you're not limited because you're an introvert. I love to say that introversion does not limit you. Just your beliefs limit you. So if your beliefs have you believing that there are things you can't do, then yeah, you're probably not even going to try, right? So... All of this conditioning, I don't want to go too far into the history of it, but all of this conditioning started back in like the turn of the the early, or the the turn of the 20th century, going in from the 1900s into the, into the, um, or I'm sorry, going from the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Uh, It was just a shift in how our society was showing up. It, It shifted from being, you know, people working out in the communities and in the farms amongst their neighbors, um, small communities, people started moving into the big industrialized cities and getting jobs at, you know, factories and things things like that. And so they went from being evaluated for their 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 ethics and their values and how they contributed to their communities to now they were being evaluated on their charisma, their likability, and they realized that they were had to compete against their their fellow employees who were essentially strangers. They had to compete against them in order to get ahead and survive. And so the culture shifted from this, what was called culture of character into culture of personality. And from there, it really, this idea of what people think of me, I've got to present my best self. I need to be, um, you know, the loudest person to be seen. Um, All of that started to take shape. And so as we got into like the the 1920s, advertising and marketing, which really started to, to, to kick in, was capitalizing on this. They were really um, promoting this this one ideal. And that's what people were looking at in order to figure out, well, this is how I need to be. So very much like today, we look at ads, we look at television, we look at social media. uh, And a lot of people use that to define, well, this is what I'm supposed to look like. This is how I'm supposed to present myself. So it was very much the same back then. So as you get into like the 1950s, now you've got this this young the young parents of the time they've grown up with all of this conditioning and so it starts making its way into schools into organizations because there was this perception of being extroverted being outgoing being really social friendly that kind of salesman personality that was the desired traits and anything that was quiet being on your own those were not seen as valuable traits and so they were not prioritized and parents really um, embraced the idea of schools helping their children to not be that way and to get them out of their shell and to get them more social and more more um, more outgoing. And that that conditioning just gets woven in generation after generation after generation. And so here we are 70 to 100 years later, if not more than 100 years later, and we still have that extrovert ideal that perpetuates in everything that we do. So we can see this conditioning in TV shows, movies, books, Uh, you know, the the main character is typically um, the main character is typically the extrovert, right? The main character is the the popular one, the one who gets the the girl or the guy and the the big house, the great job, the, 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 the nice car, whatever it is. And any introverted characters are portrayed as kind of quiet, geeky, nerdy, the ones who are down on their luck. And, you know, even the, even the movies or stories where somebody who is in that place, who's down on their luck and kind of the nerdy, nerdy character, if they have this transformation where they become the hero, again, they project them as now they're more, more extroverted. Now they're more outgoing. And so that subliminal messaging there is just reinforcing this belief that to be successful, to be um, accepted and, and worthy and loved and, and, and admired, you have to be this, this extrovert. And to be confident, you have to be more extroverted. To be, uh, to be awkward and quiet and, and not confident, again, is tied to that, that introvert image, which isn't, which isn't true, which isn't really, um, which isn't really accurate. So we see it in schools and how schools are organized. So lots of group work, again, being evaluated on whether you're participating or not participating. Um, Corporate, corporate jobs. You know, we see this with, you know, so many, you know, everything is now group work. I mean, I I worked in corporate for 23 years and it very much changed over that time frame where it's now 
everything is done in groups and teams and there's tons of meetings to connect and and share what's going on. There's not a lot of space to just get into what you're working on. Um, open floor office plans. Those are terrible for introverts. It's not, we talk about introvert inclusivity, open floor office plans are not inclusive for introverts. So, um, but that is all through that conditioning that, well, we all need to be social. We all need to be working in a team. If somebody's off working by themselves, then, you know, they're not going to be getting as much done. So there's all these misconceptions about how it'll work. And this, this extrovert ideal is really molding um, this, essentially this one way that we need to be, this one way we, we need to show up. Um, we also see it in social media. We see it a lot in social media. Everybody's trying to get more attention than the other person. Um, you know, everybody's trying to like, you know, they're dancing and lots of music and pointing at things and like, hey, 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 look at me. And the algorithms for the various social media platforms reward that. I mean, what's the number one form of content that social media rewards and prizes and prioritizes? It's video. And while many introverts can be perfectly fine and comfortable being on video, there's this need to constantly outperform other people and to constantly be, be making noise of some variety in order to be seen. And again, the algorithms support that and reward it. So if you're an introvert and you've been subjected to this external conditioning or uh, extrovert conditioning throughout your life, that there's just one way to be, um, that you can only be successful if you're more outgoing and a people person and, you know, can work a room, then what that ends up doing is, is it, it causes you to feel like that you're at a disadvantage. It causes you to feel like you're limited or that you have to hide, that you ha hide your introversion, that you have to pretend to be something that you're not. I call that wearing your fake extrovert mask. So you go out into the world and you pretend to be more extroverted that you, than, you, than you are to, to fit in and to not be left behind. Um, Introverts tend to think that they have to speak up more. They have to be, you know, like I said, they have to be louder. Uh, a lot of introverts also think that they're boring, which is why they put that fake extrovert mask on to try to to fit in, to try to hide um, that the fact that, you know what, they might just prefer going home on a Friday night and just reading a good book instead of going out and being all social and having lots of parties and gatherings and, um, and, and barbecues and all this kind of stuff. They was just like, yeah, I'd rather just, stay home and, and, you know, not be out amongst tons of people because there's a lot of misconceptions that if you don't enjoy being around tons of people, well, then you're antisocial or you're, you're a snobby or you're unfriendly. So a lot of introverts will work very hard to not appear that way. Um, so this conditioning is also uh, responsible for limiting what you think you can do. And I, I like to call this uh, introvert excuses. So this is where people use their introversion as an excuse for not getting uncomfortable and learning new skills and stepping out of their comfort zone. So a lot of introverts will tell me, well, I can't do video because I'm an introvert. I can't, I can't be a speaker. I can't, um, network. I can't go network. That's terrible. I'm an introvert. I can't go in there and work a room. Uh, I have people tell me, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm an introvert. I want to make new friends, but I, I, you know, I'm not social enough. I'm, I'm again, I'm boring. No one's going to be interested in hanging out with me. Um, so it, it really colors what you think you're capable of doing. And when you believe that you can't do something because of this, this quality about yourself, that's rather fixed, then you don't even try. And then you see it as a negative thing about yourself. Like, well, this isn't fair. It's, you know, it's not fair that the extroverts, this is easy for the extroverts. So it's just an extrovert world and it's not fair for me. But in reality, the extroverts feel uncomfortable too. They just don't have that introvert crutch to lean on to give them an out for not getting uncomfortable and trying it. Because all of those things that you think that you can't do because you're an introvert, it has nothing to do with being an introvert. Like I said earlier, introversion is really just about where you source your energy, how susceptible you are to external stimuli, and whether you're an internal versus an external processor. So it has nothing to do with whether you can network or talk to people or um, give presentations or do lives or whatever it is. All of that, that belief that you can't do it is really around from, or is really comes from this lack of experience which means you don't have the confidence in doing it. But when you le lean on that introvert excuse, you never give yourself permission to give it a try and to find ways that work for you 
so that you can become comfortable and maybe even fall in love with it. So the interesting thing that I've found over the years as I've as I've gone out and talked with not just introverts, but I, I talk with extroverts as well, is I've found that all of this introvert, extrovert, however you want to phrase it, conditioning has also impacted the extroverts of the world. And that's because this extrovert ideal that's basically saying, you know, be more showy, be more performative, be more talkative, be more people person, you know, social, 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 um, look at me, attract attention to yourself. All of that, um, it's making extroverts tired. Because like I said at the beginning of this episode, nobody is 100% introvert, nobody is 100% extrovert. So everybody has, you know, a little elements of both. So even even those that seem to be the most extroverted people out there, they're going to have their times and moments where they need to go retreat and be by themselves. They need to do some self-reflection. But when this pressure is out there to just be more extroverted, and the, the conditioning says that being introverted is nerdy or, you know, geeky or awkward or, you know, not confident, then it, it there's not a, a, it's a, it's painted in a negative light. Then even the extroverts aren't embracing that inner reflection, introverted side of themselves. So they're constantly trying to push harder and, and be seen more. And so they're exhausted too. So when we look at that, that means basically everybody's exhausted from this constant push to be more, more, more. And when we look at the percentages, it's been commonly accepted that, and I used to believe this for a long time, that if we look at the, the population, 25 to 30, 25 to 30% of the population uh, lean more toward the introverted side of the scale. But as I started doing research recently, that number came from a study back in the early 50s. So it's 70 years old. More recent studies have found, so this is from the Myers-Briggs um, the MBTI company, and even these studies are like, you know, almost 20 years old. They, they did some studies in the 90s and in the early 2000s that suggest that it's actually probably closer to 50, if not 55 to 57% of the population that identify as introverts or more on the introverted side of the scale. And again, that's 20 years ago. I bet if we did another study now, it would be even more because the pandemic provided and, and the lockdowns at the beginning of the pandemic provided an opportunity for a lot of people who may have been so entrenched in this, like faking it as an extrovert that they didn't even realize that they weren't. Now that they were at home all the time, it was like, oh, oh my gosh. I had so many people tell me, I, you know, I became an introvert during the pandemic. And that's not true. You don't become an introvert. They always were an introvert. They just didn't realize it because they were never in the environment where they could actually recognize it and feel the comfort of being in that space. So I bet now if we could do another study, we'd find that it's even more than 55 to 57%, maybe even in as much as 60 to 65%. So that means the majority of people out there the majority of people that you work with, that you go to school with, that you interact with, the majority of them fall on the introverted side of the scale. But everybody's still trying to be extroverted, more outgoing, more, more social, more talkative. And this is not to suggest that there's anything wrong with being more social, more talkative, more, you know, uh, you know all of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that doesn't align to who you are, then there is something wrong with constantly pretending that that is you to fit some outdated mold of what is acceptable or non-acceptable. So let's talk a little bit about why being an introvert is actually an advantage if you, know, if you identify as an introvert and how this can be the key to your success. Because I firmly believe that when you are pretending to be something that you're not, you're never really going to be able to get to that place where you can like genuinely, authentically, intentionally thrive because it's like you're swimming upstream. You're, you're trying to constantly be something that you're not, and that's exhausting. So when you learn what makes being an introvert awesome, you learn to embody those, uh, those strengths, your strengths, and you prioritize those and you protect them then that's when life feels a little bit easier. And it's when you start to really shine and thrive because now you're being 
who you're here to be and you're being genuine as to who you're here to be. So I believe that everybody has a superpower. And I do, I believe that for introverts, your introvert or your introversion is what is where you're going to find your superpower. And I believe that on the flip side, I believe that for extroverts, probably what their superpower is, is going to be rooted in those extroverted qualities. So for introverts, if you've been subjected to all of this conditioning, which you have, you're probably not connected or even aware of your superpower. It's probably something that you even dismiss as not important because it doesn't align with that extrovert ideal. So getting to the place where you can understand what your strengths are as an introvert is going to open that door for you to recognize this is what I'm a rock star at. And this is what I am a rock. This is, this is how I shine as a human. This is the gift that I give to the world and to those around me. And so when you tie into those strengths, you can discover that. And then when you, when you really lean into that and prioritize amplifying that out into the world, again, you become just magnetic and things start to change for you. So when we're talking about Str- the strengths of introverts. Now, first off, let me say, intro- you know, we're all as introverts, we're individual people. We are not carbon copies of each other. My strengths may not be your strengths and vice versa. But there are some characteristics that tend to be common or tend to be, you know, commonly shared among, amongst, introvert- amongst introverts. Uh, the first one is that introverts tend to be deep thinkers. Introverts tend to be able to to go really, you know, focused into a specific topic and and fully understand it, fully immerse themselves into it, to think about it on different levels from different aspects. And so that really helps introverts to be very knowledgeable on on the topics that interest them. This is why also that multitasking can be a little bit detrimental for introverts because if we are really um, working on something and we're really honed in and focused on it, if we get pulled out all the time from, you know, people popping in, you know, by our desk or constant pinging on our phone or whatever it is, then it can be very hard to get to access that deep thinking space, which is where we get recharged from being in that space. And it's a lot for a lot of introverts, we enjoy being in that space. Introverts also tend to be very detail oriented, which is such a lovely gift. A lot of people are so focused on um, moving on to the next thing. They don't see the details. We need people who see details. We need people who can, can if you're sitting back and observing instead of talking and, and trying to be the loudest person in the room, you can notice what's happening. You can start to connect the dots. And like if you're in like a work situation, this is such a valuable gift to bring to the table where you can do your thing, be a little quiet, but observe, 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 and then say, hey, okay, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this, what I'm really getting from this, and then connect all those dots. Nobody else is going to see that. That's a huge gift that you can bring to a table. A lot of introverts are creative. It's no surprise that a lot of artists and a lot of, you know, you know, whether it's music or or visual arts or, um, you know, whatever it is, a lot of of creative artistic people tend to be more introverted. Now that doesn't mean that you're not going to ever find any extroverted artist. Of course not. There are obviously, um, it, it spans all, but um, a lot of creative people tend to, again, identify with that introverted side. And that's because again, we go deep into our mind. We have a very rich active mind because we are those internal processors. And so that lends itself really nicely to creative, creative expression. Introverts tend to also be excellent problem solvers. And again, that's because we notice all the details and we're very, again, those deep thinkers. So we can see all of the the the, the pieces at play and that helps us to see where the problems are. So then we can make suggestions on how to solve those problems. Introverts are great listeners. Now that could be because since we're not talking all the time, other people just assume that that we're 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 great listeners, but I do believe. Um, because we don't talk all the time, we are genuinely interested in, in other people, we listen on a, on a deeper level because we're not listening to people looking for those holes for where we can jump in and start talking about ourselves again. We are we actually usually want to put the attention off of ourselves so we take a greater interest in other people and that means that we're really great listeners. And that's a skill that 
not everybody has. And when you're, when somebody's talking to you and you're a great listener, that's a great gift to give people because most people in this day and age, they don't feel like they're, they're really heard or seen by other people. So that's a great, as long as you don't go too far and, and let people like verbally dump on you, that can be a little bit of a, um, something to watch out for. If people constantly tell you you're a great listener. Introverts are great at working alone. We don't need a lot of oversight. Just give us our task and let us go to it. So that as an, if you're an employee, if you're on a team, that's a huge asset. I used to, when I was in corporate, I managed people and I managed people internationally and I didn't want to have to be following up with people every day to ask them, are, you know, have you got your stuff done? Do you have your, you know, is everything done? Um, the last team that I managed and worked with, most of them were introverts and I never had to check up on them. They got their stuff done and I knew that they could work really well on their own. And that as a manager is such a gift to have people who can, who can do that, who can work on their own with very little oversight. Introverts are also, this is my favorite part of being an introvert is that you enjoy your own company. So you don't need other people. Not saying that you don't enjoy having other people around you to entertain you. You don't necessarily need to have other people around you to entertain you. So that's why at the beginning of like the pandemic and the lockdown, the extroverts were, they got to have a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be in an environment that's not conducive to how they they recharge. And so for introverts, um, we were like, hey, this is great. We get to just, be, you know, be in our own company and do the things that we enjoy doing. And so it wasn't as it wasn't as hard for introverts as it was for extroverts at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's because of, of this ability to just be our own company. So yeah, so that is some of the strengths. Now, obviously that's not all the strengths. That's just some of the, the more common ones. Um, you may identify with some of those. You may not. Uh, and I And I guarantee you, you have other strengths that aren't on this list. So when we talk about embodying your gifts, your strengths as an introvert to really lean into um, owning it and standing in that power and not being a victim of all the the, the, um, extrovert conditioning, the first piece of that is to do a little self-reflection. You know, actually, I guess I should back up. The first piece actually is to do a little bit more research on it to connect in with what makes you awesome as an introvert. There's a number of books that are specific to introverts. You can go onto like Amazon and just type in introvert and you'll find some really great books. And those are all wonderful to read, to really, to, to really just attach yourself to what makes you awesome and to start to to unravel that conditioning that says there's something wrong or that you're at a disadvantage because you're an introvert. So do a little research on it, tap into those gifts and strengths. You can even just Google, you know, strengths of an introvert, advantages of an introvert, and you will find tons of different articles that will that will tell you these are what's great. This, these are all the reasons that introverts are needed and, and valued in this world. And that's going to help you to start to see that and see your introversion from a different perspective. And so once you do that, the next step is to really be open to what that means for you. Do some self-reflection. What is, what's, what's lighting you up about that? What about all of the gifts and strengths and advantages that when you, when you, when you do that research, what do you identify with? What reason, what resonates with you? Get all of that down so that you can see the evidence that you are, you shine because you're an introvert. And then the next thing is that you really want to be willing to Take what you learn as you learn your strengths, you learn your gifts, you learn um, where you shine as a a human because of these introverted qualities. And you want to be willing to get uncomfortable, to get out of your comfort zone, to take that information and anything that you're telling yourself that you can't do because you're an introvert or anything that you feel like, hey, I'd really love to do that, but oh, that's so far out of my comfort zone. weigh that up against the strengths that you uncovered about yourself and see if there are ways that you can go about getting the experience to help you grow your confidence in a way that aligns to your strengths. That's going to help you build that confidence a lot faster. And then the final thing to help you embody all this is just to be really aware of your energy. So be aware of what drains you. Be aware of what recharges you. And when you get clear, clarity on that, you want to minimize the things that drain you and you want to prioritize the things that refuel you. Because if you are constantly on empty or you're hitting that what I call introvert hangover or you hit the introvert wall, which 
gives you uh, means you end up landing in uh, that space of an introvert hangover, then you're going to be too energetically tired to connect with who you are, to feel good about who you are, to get out of your comfort zone. So you want to make sure that you're protecting your energy because again, the world is not designed to facilitate how we as introverts get our energy. So you have to be your advocate for that. So protect your energy so that you have sustainable energy so that you can take the action steps you need to grow the confidence in being who you are. And I do, by the way, have some some free workbooks on assessing your energy, getting more clarity around your energy, what drains you, what fuels you up, and how to, to create an energy management plan. And then I also have another freebie about the introvert hangover, like what that is, how to avoid it, and what to do if you land in that. So I will leave links um, for those. And that's pretty much it. So I hope that listening to this, you have more clarity around not only what it means to be an introvert and what it what is not being an introvert, but you have clarity around what may have influenced you to believe that you are not um, as advantageous. You're not as in, in such a, it's, it's that it's difficult for you to just be yourself. I hope that you have more insight and awareness around how you don't have to change who you are. You just have to change how you see yourself. So if you need help with this, this is what I do with my clients. I go really deep with this with my clients. So um, feel free to jump on or schedule a uh, one-on-one introvert awareness and expansion call. And that's where we can explore how we can work together. But it's also where I can help you to identify where you're being um, influenced by this conditioning so that you can start to take control of that. I can also help you identify what some of those introvert strengths are so that you can walk away from the call at giving yourself permission to do things your way. And again, if you want to explore working together, then that is also something that we can do. So I will leave a link for that. But otherwise, um, you know, check out my blog, check out uh, my other YouTube episodes, my Quietly Thriving uh, show episodes, and do the research, take ownership of that to start to reject that belief that you are limited in any way because you're an introvert, because you are so not limited. Um, Just your beliefs are what's limiting you. So take ownership of it, Find your strengths, find your superpower, and go quietly live in this this beautiful space where you can quietly thrive unapologetically. 